Okay, I'm not going to lie. This is a really hard story for me to tell. But I'm telling it because if it will help just one person, then this video is going to be worth it. Well, hello, my silky friends. Yeah, I don't usually do story time, but I feel like this is important. A few months ago, I was in a conversation online and in one of my other videos or something, and it made me recall a memory from a long time ago. And usually when I think of things like this, I, you know, spend two seconds on it and then I just let it go. Well, this has been haunting me for the last couple of months, and I keep thinking, why is this on my mind? Somebody must need to hear this story. And I don't know if the plan was to traffic or just assault me, but this started out as a simple job interview. Okay, so girls, please pay attention and guys too nowadays. All right, so let me give you some backstory because this is going to be important kind of, I hope I can make you understand why I ignored the red flags and why I was so desperate, okay? So I had been, I had moved, I was newly married just like maybe a year and a half and we had moved from Virginia to Charlotte, North Carolina. And, you know, we were young, we were both unskilled, I was not a nurse at that time. And so, you know, we were just kind of taking whatever jobs we could to get by. And Charlotte is a very expensive city to live in, or at least it was back then. Now, a few months into living there, my husband came in one day and he said, you know what, I don't want to be married anymore. And I want you to get out of the apartment. Now, I had done nothing. I had a job that I loved. And I was shocked, brokenhearted, traumatized. And I took my car and went back home to my mama in Virginia. So, you know, it, it was bad. It was just bad. Back and forth for a couple of months, he would change his mind. No, let's make this work, whatever. So I had decided I had come through a lot of heartbreak and I was at the point where the marriage was not my first priority in that I wasn't sure that it was even going to last another week, but I knew I didn't want to leave Charlotte. So I thought I've got to find a really good job where I can maybe find somewhere to live on my own. So I answered an, an ad for a secretarial position, you know, um, exec, I don't know, administrative assistant, something of that nature. Now, Charlotte is a paper town and they have a lot of, you know, office buildings everywhere. And it just so happened that this job was literally probably less than a mile from the apartment that we were living in at the time. And I thought, oh, this is convenient because in the worst case scenario, I could actually walk there if I had to. So I got a call back and the guy tells me, you know, I'm really busy at work today. He said, but I, I do want to interview you. Can you come a little bit later? You know, the office shuts down at five. Can you come in about 530 and we can, you know, have this interview? And I'm like, sure. I mean, what was I doing? So I, you know, got ready. I got dressed. And as I pulled into the parking lot, which normally it was a two story, you know, very executive looking office, glass windows everywhere in a nice part of town. OK, it wasn't like I was in a dangerous place. Now, I mean, when I pulled into the parking lot, I noticed there were no cars like I didn't see one car. And I'm like, man, these people get out of here quick. Um, and it felt a little weird you know I'm like I don't know about is this guy even gonna be here so I got out of the car and I walked in and to my surprise the lobby door was open so there was not a doorman there was not a anybody in reception it was just a big big empty deathly quiet building and so I'm looking around and I'm thinking I've never gone on an interview like this and I had to go to the second floor. So I went up the elevator and got, went to the suite number that this man gave me 
and I thought, okay, you know, there's probably a lot of people in the office there, you know, somebody else is going to be there. But when I walked in, there wasn't, there was nobody at the front. And then I thought, well, you know, he is looking for a secretary, right? I'm telling myself all these crazy things just to, I guess, validate it, just to make it seem, okay, this is, you know, don't freak out. Don't freak out, Silky. It's just, you know, it's just after hours. And let me say this, it was also summertime. So it was right daylight. Okay. I wasn't walking in the dark and all this stuff. And so I hear a voice say, come in. So I came into the, you know, very front of, I could see another door and it was slightly ajar. And I just sat down on the couch that was in the waiting area. And I thought, all right, this seems legit. It's actually an office. And this guy comes out and he greets me and he was, I would say maybe a little bit more casual, a little bit more friendly, you know, than your very strict, you know, executive would be. But I mean, I'm like, okay, it's after hours. He's just chilling. And he starts asking me questions. Are you married? Blah, blah, blah. And, you know, back in those days, okay, I was young. Let me say this. I was very young. I was either 19 or 20. I think I was 20. And, but I was very naive. Okay. I wasn't, especially in the city, all my dealings with people had been very professional. I was young at that time. I was cutie pie back then, you know, those were the days, right? And so I, you know, I didn't think of it. I'm just thinking, okay, I can do this job, right? And so he starts asking me these questions and I didn't know at that time that you really can't ask those questions because how many interviews had I actually been on by this time? Not a whole lot. And, you know, he started telling me that he was in, in import, export, kind of, you know, I asked him what his business was because I saw like pictures of things on the walls and but there was nothing about this office that told me okay you know this is you know a manufacturing sales person or this is a um i I don't know there was nothing about the business that i could see it had you know something random on the names like you know abc associates or something it's like it told me nothing and so this guy's talking to me and you know, he says the normal things, you know, the hours, blah, blah, blah. And I'm looking for a person who can do this and that you'll be my personal assistant. I'm, you know, I have a lot of contacts and, and you're going to have to talk to people, yada, yada. That's fine. And then he starts to say things like, well, I go on business trips to Las Vegas several times a year and it's probably going to start being a little bit more often. And I'm thinking, okay. And I, again, I'm asking him, well, what is the nature of your business? Like, what do you do? And he was just kind of import export, no real specifics. Like he didn't say I'm a diamond trader or, you know, nothing. There was not a product. And so I thought, okay, this is a little odd. And I thought, I mean, you know, are you mafia? You know, are you like, is somebody, I don't know, like, what is your product? So he's just talking about trips and he said, I'm going to be gone a good amount of time. And I'm thinking, okay, good. You're, you're gone. Great. And he's like, no, I need an assistant to go with me. He said, my, the person that I hire is going to have to go to Vegas with me and is going to have to, you know, do this and that because you're going to have to keep up with all this paperwork and all these people, you know, as I'm doing business. And, you know, I don't even know this guy, right? And I'm thinking, okay, I desperately need a job and he is offering more money than I have seen. You know, it wasn't a huge amount, okay? But it was probably a couple of dollars more than I had actually ever made. And so anyway, I'm thinking about it. He said, I know you're married. He said, you know, would that be something that your husband would allow you to do? And I honestly, at this point, you know, I'm just very frank. And I, you know, I thought about it and I said, well, it really doesn't matter because um, I have to have a job. And I didn't go into my personal life, but I said, work is more important to me at this particular moment. And he's like, oh, great, great. Yeah. And so I, 
I should have seen the red flags. I should have, by this time, I should have run out the door. And then he just wanted to give me an office tour. But there were only two rooms to this office, the outer lobby and his office. And so he says, oh, come here and look at this. So he guides me over to the back part of the office where he's got some kind of pictures. I don't know if it's, I can't remember, pictures of him golfing with somebody or, I don't know, something random. And I'm like, okay. And um, he's like, no, I want you to really look at this picture. And so he's standing behind me. And there is this like big desk type thing in front of me. So there's nothing but the wall, this desk, and then him right behind me. And he puts his hands on my shoulders. And at first I'm, I'm telling myself stupidly, oh, he's just trying to get my attention, like turn me over, you know, a little bit this way, like look at this. And then he started like more like squeezing my shoulders. And I, I froze, okay, because there was a lot of stuff in my childhood that I don't talk about, a lot of abuse. And when you are a victim, until you learn to fight back, one of your reactions will be to simply freeze. Um, when you're touched and it feels inappropriate, back in those days, my whole body would just freeze like I was a statue. But now, these days, what would happen is you would be picking your teeth up off the floor with your broken arm because I would hurt you, buddy. Um, but that's, that wasn't me back then. And um, so he starts holding my shoulders. And then I realized, I looked over at the door and realized that what he had done while my back was turned towards the um, picture is he had locked me in the, the office. And so he starts getting closer and closer behind me. And then he starts just massaging my shoulders. Okay. There's no holding back. And I am terrified because I think at this moment, I am going to be essayed, maybe killed or trafficked. And I didn't really even know what trafficking was back then, but I knew it was something and it wasn't good. Um, and I thought he goes to all these places. Like I'm, I'm just going to disappear. That's what's going to happen. And so I just started praying and I'm like, Jesus, Jesus. And like in my head, I'm like, please, please help me. I don't know what to do. I'm scared and I can't move. Like, you're going to have to help me. God, get me out of this situation. And at that moment, um, his phone rang. And at first he said, oh, um, you know, never mind. It's after hours. I'm not going to answer that as his hands are still creeping down my shoulders. And then all of a sudden, I don't know where he changes his mind. He's like, oh, well, wait a second. He says, I am expecting a really important call. So he gets on the phone and he starts talking. And I can tell I'm just sitting there and I thought, I'm not going to panic. I'm going to let him get involved in this conversation. So I wait for just a minute and I can tell it's getting more in depth. And I, you know, I kind of smiled at him like to disarm him and make him think oh she's cool she's chill she's gonna wait and then buddy I took off and I ran I unlocked that door and I flew down the stairs out the door to my car and I was gone and you know I I couldn't really I honestly I couldn't even believe that I'd made it out of the building and I was like oh thank you god thank you god like I know you're watching me i know you're watching after me and so i i drive the mile you know back to my house and i'm shaking like i'm literally shaking like this and i am now not frozen i am just in a panic and so i walked in the apartment door and my husband He's like, well, you know, how did it go? And so I start crying. I'm just, I'm just crying. And I just start pouring and tears streaming down and I'm shaking. And I tell him exactly what happened thinking that, you know, okay, I don't expect you to go and hurt him, but I thought he would call the police. I thought he would do something. And he just looked at me and he said, you're an idiot. And I mean, as I'm crying and I'm shaking he starts to tell me how stupid I was to go into an empty building. And I, I see that now. I mean, he was right. <laughs> I mean, I was dumb. Um, 
but he said you should have he said if there was nobody there you should have never walked in that building and you know you're lucky and you know that was just a stupid thing and he refused to like comfort me at all and um you know i looking back i'm like that's not surprising <laughs> it's it's it wasn't funny then i mean it's really not funny now but it kind of is um anyway <laughs> i have a much better life now but you know even after that for several weeks i would get calls um and we didn't have a phone with caller id or anything like that so i mean I, out applying for jobs you answer the phone every time it rings right and so i never knew if it was going to be him but this guy i had forgotten you know of course on my application i had my phone number and um for weeks after that he would call me and i don't know if he ever came by the apartment i assume my address was on there and i i did i lived in fear for a while and you know he would say hey um the first thing he did is he called and and he said hey what happened you, you just ran out and you know I, I was like i told him well i could see that you were busy i mean i could tell that you were on an important business call and we had you know basically said everything that we needed to say and i thought well if you want to hire me you'll call me back of course i was never going to take the job um but i was trying to act normal because i didn't want to give this man any red flags to make him think that i would call the authorities and then you know of course i could just disappear and um uh, obviously my husband wasn't gonna look for me and then he kept calling me week after week and i told him i didn't want the job and i wasn't interested and blah 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 and um he just kept trying to convince me to come back and to you know that we were a good fit and i was the only person he wanted to hire and um after i kept saying no and watching behind my back all the time everywhere i went um, finally, he did leave me alone. So that was the end of that. I almost can still see this man's face after all these years. Um, you know, if, if you put him in a lineup at the age that he was then, I could probably pick him out. It was traumatizing. Um, and I was very, very lucky. I do not know what his plans were for me. And um, so I just wanted to share this story because... The thing is, is like, don't ignore red flags. Even when you think like, we all know when you go on a date, if you meet somebody online, if you know, whatever, we're aware. But when you go to a job interview in a respectable building in a place that there are multi offices, you never expect something like this to happen. So what I just want to say to you, girls, guys, whoever out there is if you are in a situation, and all of a sudden you get a mm, something is not right, you get a weird feeling, look, just go, just go. Because if it's legit, and you get this bad feeling, you know, look, you can always pass it off as something else. So what if you don't get the job, and it was legit, you don't get the job. It's not the end of the world. It could be the end of your life, okay? So that's what I'm saying. Trust your gut. Always, always trust your gut. And that's when I really started learning to trust my gut. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to share that. I hope it helps somebody. I hope it makes you think. Um, I hope it gives you a lot of self-confidence. I love you all. Thanks for listening. I will see you next time. In the meantime, you know what you do. Stay silky. Bye-bye.